The United States Supreme Court heard oral arguments in Garland v. Cargill. This is the case challenging ATF's bump stock ban that came about after the tragic shooting in Las Vegas. Now, leading up to oral arguments, I felt pretty good about this case resulting in a win for the Second Amendment community, even though this case is really not about the Second Amendment, it's more about statutory interpretation. And I was also very hopeful that the Supreme Court would finally spank ATF and put them in their place. But after listening to oral arguments yesterday, well, I'm not feeling quite as confident as I previously did. If you want to know why, be sure to stick around. Hello everyone and welcome to the Firearm Firm channel. I'm attorney James Phillips, a founding partner of Katz and Phillips PA, also known as the Firearm Firm. Today we're going to be talking about the oral arguments that the United States Supreme Court heard yesterday in the Garland v. Cargill case. But before we do, be sure to show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. And of course, be sure to hit that subscribe icon down in the right hand corner of this video to subscribe to the Firearm Firm's channel. The issue in the Garland v. Cargill case is whether a bump stock device is a machine gun as defined in 26 U.S.C. 5845 subsection B because it is designed and intended for use in converting a rifle into a machine gun, i.e. into a weapon that fires automatically more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. 26 U.S.C. 5845B defines a machine gun as any weapon which shoots, is designed to shoot, or can be rarely restored to shoot automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. The term shall also include the frame or receiver of any such weapon any part designed and intended solely and exclusively or a combination of parts designed and intended for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun and any combination of parts from which a machine gun can be assembled if such parts are in the possession or under the control of a person. In yesterday's arguments, the government's whole argument was that when Congress wrote the phrase single function of the trigger, they used that term interchangeably with the single pull of the trigger. Their position was that this phrase goes to the action of the shooter pulling back one time on the trigger. Now, Cargill's attorney's position was that it has nothing to do with the person, but instead the phrase single function of the trigger looks at the internal function of the inanimate object being the trigger. One point I took out of yesterday's argument was that several of the justices could not get past the rate of fire issue, which by the way is not discussed in the statute itself. This is why I say that- Can I ask you, um, just kind of maybe stepping back a moment. Why do these various distinctions with respect to operations matter? I mean, I, I read this statute to be a classification statute that Congress is directing everyone or us to identify certain kinds of weapons, and those certain kinds of weapons are being treated in a particular way. They're being prohibited. And so I guess what I'm trying to understand is if, if it's true that um, you know, the distinction that is being focused on here is the one between the movement of the trigger going back and forth or the trigger staying the same. I'm trying to understand why that matters for the purpose of this classification. So I think we don't think it does because we don't think function of the trigger means movement of the trigger. We think it means act of the shooter. That's how it was used at the time by educated speakers of English, including the president of the NRA when he proposed the language that became the statute to Congress. And ever since, people have equated function of the trigger with pull of the trigger. That makes perfect sense if, like us, you read function of the trigger to mean some act by the shooter. I don't think that works on my friends. But I guess I'm wondering what, what I thought your answer was going to be. We don't think it matters because of something you said in the intro, which was that's uh, these are the, uh, the kind of weapons that Congress were was intending to prohibit because of the damage they cause or something like that. Like I read the word function to be doing significant work in this statute. And when you know function is defined, it's really not about the operation of the thing. It's about what it can achieve, what it's being used for. So I see Congress as putting function in this. The function of this trigger is to cause this kind of damage, 800 rounds a second or whatever. And, and, and so the classification of weapons that we're trying to identify with the statute are those that function in that same way. So Justice Jackson, I agree with most of that, but I want to be careful because our, our view is not that because Congress banned machine guns because they're dangerous, anything that's dangerous or that shoots fast is a machine gun. Our, we draw the evident purpose of Congress that we think my friend's interpretation would frustrate from the text that Congress enacted. Right, and so how about anything in which the trigger functions in the same way, and by function, 
I don't know that that necessarily means it has to move in the same way. It has to operate in the same way. It can function in the same way insofar as it automatically allows for 800 rounds to be released. So, exactly. We think the function of the trigger is what lets the shooter start the firing sequence, and we think all of the parts of the statutory definition are aimed at, we're worried about guns that let you shoot many shots without repeated manual actions, right? So it's, it's a single function of the trigger. Does the shooter have to do one thing or many things? Thank you. There is no question that a bump stock increases the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm, but that in itself does not make it a machine gun. Attorneys for Cargill tried to explain this to the justices, but I think it went over the heads of several of them because they appear to lack knowledge on how a semi-automatic rifle works. In order to be a machine gun under the statute, the firearm has to fire automatically more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. It is not just the firearm has to fire at a faster rate of speed. Justice Barrett seemed to understand this issue based on the following questions she asked. Mr. Fletcher, um so I did watch all of these videos and try to figure out exactly what this looks like. And I just want to ask you about this bump firing thing. Mm -hmm. So what if I designed something and I call it a bump band? Because I gather you can do this with yeah. bands and you can do it with your belt loop. So what if I designed and market something I call the bump band to help me turn my semi-automatic you know, yep. in the same way, why wouldn't that then be a machine gun under the statute? So we think that's still not functioning automatically because that's not a self-regulating mechanism. My understanding is that what those devices do is they help the shooter keep their trigger finger still, but the shooter still has to manage the movement of the rifle back and forth, hold it so that it moves backwards just the right distance in just the right direction, then hold it again so it moves forward in just the right distance in just the right direction. And what makes a bump stock different is that it's a device that is built for just this purpose. It has the finger ledge that holds your finger in place, but then it also has a sliding function built in so that when a shot is fired, the recoil automatically pushes the rifle back, lets it disengage from the trigger so the shooter doesn't have to manually release it, and then allows it to slide forward again, again, just the right distance in just the right direction. Maybe Mr. Mitchell can help me understand from his point of view what that means, because it seems like it helps you do it better and in a more stable way, but that it functions the same way. But, but the other question I have, look, intuitively, I am entirely sympathetic to your argument. I mean, and it, and it seems like, yes, it, this is functioning like a machine gun would. But, you know, looking at that definition, I think the question is, why didn't Congress pass that litigation, I mean, that legislation to, to make this covered more clearly? Um, I think your argument depends on volition, right? So let me give you a hypothetical and then tell me if you think this satisfies the definition of machine gun. Let's imagine someone builds a fully automatic machine gun and I won't try to come up with the technology for exactly how this is gonna happen, but they install a tripwire on their property and they just leave the gun there unattended, walk away. Somebody trips the wire and then it begins shooting lots of rounds. Yeah. Does that satisfy your definition of a machine gun? I think it does, yes. Why? Because a single act, and you know, I think we've used different words like volition. I think what we're, the idea that we're trying to get at is does some separate act is that required, some manual act required for each shot, or is a single continuous act resulting in the firing of multiple shots? That's an unusual way to activate a machine gun, obviously, but right. I think even if it's a tripwire, that's still one act by a person that initiates a multi-shot fire. But it's an unintentional act, in the same way you might say if your finger, because for the bump stock to work, you still have to have your finger right there, right? You do, yeah. And, and, it, and it, according to the Fifth Circuit, what you're focusing on is the definition, you know, it looked at it from the perspective of the gun and the machinery of the gun, but you still do need your finger there to kind of pull back the trigger the same way that you would if it was volitional. So not quite, actually, Justice Barron, I think this is important. When, in the typical way that you fire these bump stocks, and this the Fifth Circuit acknowledged at 21A of the petition appendix, you don't initiate firing by pulling backward with your trigger finger. The trigger finger stays completely stationary. Push. You initiate by pushing, and what the expert said and the district court found is you could replace your trigger finger with a little plastic post attached to the bump stock, and it would work in exactly the same way. So it's, it's true that you have to keep your finger there, and if you moved your finger away, the bump firing sequence would stop, but that's a pretty trivial additional piece of input from the shooter. Really, what's starting and continuing the sequence is the push forward. Thank you. Yesterday's oral arguments lasted just a little over an hour, and I don't want to play the whole thing, but I want to leave you with the last part by Justice Gorsuch, because he points out the magnitude of what ATF did. On, on that score, can we just step back a minute? Um, I can certainly understand why these items should be made illegal. Uh, but <clears throat> we're dealing with a statute that was enacted in the 1930s. And uh, through many administrations, 
the government took the position that these bump stocks are not machine guns. Uh, and then you, you adopted an interpretive rule, not even a legislative rule, saying otherwise that would render between a quarter of a million and a half million people <clears throat> federal felons, um, and not even through an APA process they could challenge, subject to 10 years in federal prison. Um, and the only way they can challenge it is if they're prosecuted, and they may well wind up dispossessed of guns, all guns in the future, as well as a lot of other civil rights, including the right to vote. And I, I guess I just want your reaction to, to that, and I believe there were a number of members of Congress, including uh, Senator Feinstein, who said that this administrative action forestalled legislation that would have dealt with this topic directly, rather than trying to use a nearly 100-year-old statute in a way that many administrations hadn't anticipated. Thoughts? There's a lot packed in there, so as you might expect, I have a lot of thoughts. I think the main one is this court often concludes that the government has interpreted a statute the wrong way and doesn't hesitate to correct the government's mistakes. I think the government should do the same thing. After the Las Vegas shooting, the deadliest shooting in our nation's history, I think it would have been irresponsible for the ATF not to take another closer look at this prior interpretation, which was reflected in a handful of classification letters, and to look at the problem more carefully. And having done that, I think it would have been irresponsible if the ATF concluded, as it did, that these devices are prohibited under the best reading of the statute for the ATF not to fix it. Then why errors. not do a legislative rule properly, and in which I, I know you did notice and comment, but it was an interpretive rule, and an interpretive rule you can more or less just issue. And, and you don't even have to put it in the Federal Register. I mean, you, maybe you do in some circumstances, but not all. Well, just and, and, and you're, you're, you're creating a class of, again, between a quarter of a million and a half million people who have, in reliance on past administrations, Republican and Democrat, who said that this does not qualify under a very old statute, taken actions. And an interpretive rule, you can't even challenge it in an APA posture. Well, we are in an APA posture. They are challenging an interpretation. Well, I understand and, and, that, but in your reply brief, you say, oh, don't touch that, because that's not before us. That's not part of the QP. And in an interpretive rule, you don't get an APA challenge. You get, you, you get a criminal prosecution against you is what you get. So I, I, I guess I disagree with that on a number of levels. First, I would think it would be better for those who are concerned about administrative power that we acknowledge this is an interpretive rule. The ATF doesn't have the power to make something a crime that wasn't a crime before. It's not a crime to violate the rule. It has been and always <clears throat> will be a crime to violate the statute. The ATF is saying we got that wrong before and we're fixing it now. And you're right. It would be horribly unfair to prosecute people who possess these devices in reliance on the agency's past assurance. But that is taken care of through doctrines like entrapment by estoppel, which ensure that no one has been and no one will be prosecuted for possessing these guns during or these devices during a time when ATF said it was legal. But that's not a reason to shackle the ATF and certainly not a reason to shackle this court to adopt something other than the best reading of the words Congress wrote. And it's true, Congress wrote those words 90 years ago, but we think it used capacious language, like function of a trigger instead of pull of a trigger. And then in 1968, added parts that can be used to convert something into a machine gun, precisely because it understood that Americans are have a lot of ingenuity and a lot of creativity. There are a lot of ways to build something that is a machine gun, and I don't think you should hesitate from applying the broad language that Congress wrote, consistent with the meaning that it has always had. What's so, how do I think the United States Supreme Court will rule in this case? I still think it will be in our favor, but after yesterday's argument, I could also see it going either way. Whichever way it falls, I think it will be a close decision with the 5-4 ruling. Be sure to let us know what you think about yesterday's oral arguments and how you think the court will ultimately rule down in the comments section below, along with any questions you may have. Until next time, stay armed and educated.